Welcome to Music History Monday for August 7th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is All Hail the King. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark an online auction that concluded on August 7, 2008, 15 years ago today at which Elvis Presley's white, sweat-stained, high-collared, plunging V-neck jumpsuit, decorated with a dazzling hand-embroidered blue and gold peacock, sold for $300,000. Um, because I know you want to know, the jumpsuit is cinched at the waist by a wide belt decorated in gold medallions in a design meant to resemble the eye of a peacock feather, all of it an ongoing reflection of Elvis's fascination with peacocks as being his personal good luck symbol. The outfit cost Elvis a cool $10,000. It was designed by the Los Angeles couturier Bill Bellew, 1931 to 2008, who designed all of the king's stage wardrobe between 1968 and 1977. Now, talk about provenance, something we'll define and discuss in just a bit. Aside from Elvis's personal sweat stains, do they still give off an odor? He performed wearing this very same jumpsuit for the better part of a year. Elvis first wore the peacock at a concert at the Forum in Los Angeles on May 11, 1974. He then performed wearing it in Las Vegas and wore it as well on the cover of his album Promised Land, which was released in 1975. In their pre-sale estimate, the auction house, gotta have it, had anticipated that the jumpsuit would bring between $275,000 and $325,000. The $300,000 hammer price was then nothing short of a surgical strike. At the time of that auction, which closed exactly 15 years ago today, the peacock jumpsuit was the most expensive piece of Elvis Presley memorabilia ever sold at auction. I would tell you that up to that time, the previous record for an Elvis collectible was $295,000 for his 1956 Lincoln Continental Mark II, which was sold in 1999 at an auction held at Graceland. The peacock jumpsuit might have been the most expensive piece of Elvis Presley memorabilia sold at auction up to 2008, oh, but its selling price has long since been surpassed. Do not fret. We'll talk about some of those more expensive items in due time. As for the identities of the jumpsuit's seller and its buyer, well, who knows? We only know that the seller was described by the auctioneer as, quote, a big Elvis collector. Unquote. As for who ponied up the 300k for the outfit, the auction house, gotta have it, has declined to identify the buyer. What's it worth? As a collector, I am often asked regarding an object, what's that worth? A my honest but unsatisfying response is always the same. It's worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. Putting an absolute value on any antique slash collectible is entirely subjective. Collectors almost inevitably believe that their stuff is worth more than it really is. Part of the problem 
is the legion of collector's books that contain price guides. In order to sell more copies of the books, such coin and antique collector's guides are far more often than not filled with atmospheric price valuations. OMG, Edgar, according to this here price guide, my 1909 Indian head penny is worth $30,000. Yeah, sorry, Chauncey, it's only worth $30,000 if you can convince some poor dumb sucker to pay $30,000 for it. Until then, it's worth all of one cent. When it comes to high-end stuff, auctions and the open market auctions represent are probably the best way to gauge what something is worth at a given point in time. Regarding auctions, let us please be aware that in an auction, it is not the winning bidder who establishes the selling price, but rather the underbidder, the losing bidder. Someone might be willing to spend a thousand dollars for an item, but if the next highest bidder, the underbidder, stops at $500, the item's final price will typically be $550, 10% over the second highest bid. As such, it is the underbidder who establishes value and not the winner who might have been willing to go much higher. At auction, then, the value of any particular item, like Elvis Presley's peacock jumpsuit, is determined by its reserve, meaning minimum price, or by two people who bid against each other until one of them, the underbidder, drops out. In an auction, what an object is worth, what someone is willing to pay for something, is a function of its desirability, its rarity, and its condition. Desirability, well, desirability is purely subjective. For example, I personally have no desire to own the fossilized skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex. To be honest with you, if I had the room in my house to display a 40-foot-long dinosaur skeleton, I'd fill that space instead with a ping-pong table and pinball machines. Nevertheless, if I did hanker for my own Tyrannosaurus skeleton, and I was willing and able to pay for the rarest and best one available in terms of its completeness and condition, then I would have bid on Stan, a mostly complete 39-foot-long Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton excavated in South Dakota in 1992. Discovered by an amateur paleontologist named Stan Satrison, who gave his name to the fossil, Stan sold in an auction held by Christie's on October 6, 2020, for a staggering $31.8 million. It was the highest price ever paid at auction for a fossil. For our information, the previous record holder was another T-Rex skeleton dug up in South Dakota. Named Sue, this one was bought by the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago for $8.36 million in 1997. To the question, is Stan really worth $31.8 million? Given his rarity and condition, he was clearly worth it to the anonymous buyer who bought him and the anonymous person or institution who was the underbidder. Provenance. Having provenance adds to the value of almost any collectible. The term provenance comes from the French provenir, which means to come from. Provenance is comparable to the legal term chain of custody. It represents the authenticity of an object based on the history of its creation and ownership. Like transferring a deed to a house, certain types of valuable objects require provenance, 
proof of a history of ownership in order to legally change hands. Establishing provenance is especially important when dealing with high-end antiquities, which might have been illegally dug up, meaning looted, stolen, or outright counterfeited. Without the proper provenance, the sale of even the most magnificent object can be undone. For example, one of the most desirable and historically important coins ever minted came to auction on October 30th, 2020. The coin is an aureus, a Roman gold piece that was minted in 42 BCE by Marcus Junius Brutus. The design of the coin refers to the assassination of Julius Caesar two years before, in 44 BCE. The coin's obverse, meaning its front, depicts Brutus himself, the most famous of Caesar's assassins. The coin's reverse depicts the words Id Mar, or the Ides of March, the date of Caesar's assassination, March 15th, as well as two daggers and a pileus. A pileus was a cap worn by freed slaves, symbolizing their liberty, which suggests that Caesar's assassination was a heroic act that freed the Roman Republic of a tyrant. The coin to be auctioned was only the third known example of a gold Ides of March coin. The auctioneer was Roma Numismatics, a well-known operation headquartered in London and owned and managed by one Richard Beale. The coin's lengthy catalog copy read in briefest part, quote, Foremost of the reasons for the exalted position of the Idmar type in the collective consciousness is its naked and shameless celebration of the murder of Julius Caesar two years earlier, in 44 BC. By the way, a link to the entire auction catalog copy is provided. The coin was declared to be genuine by the Numismatic Guarantee Company, or NGC, the industry standard operation that grades and verifies the authenticity of coins from any period, from anywhere in the world. The coin came with what appeared to be an unimpeachable provenance. We quote the auction catalog copy. Quote, from the collection of the Baron Dominique de Chabrier, original attestation of provenance included. X collection, meaning formerly of the collection of Bernard de Chambrier, 1878-1963, and Marie Alvina Irma von Bachstetten, 1893-1968. X collection of the Baron Gustav Charles Ferdinand von Bonstetten, Chamberlain to Ferdinand I, Emperor of Austria. Unquote. Well, that is a most impressive provenance. The coin sold for two point seven million pounds, or four million one hundred and eighty eight thousand three hundred and ninety three dollars, on october twenty ninth, twenty twenty, setting a record for an ancient coin. It was purchased by an unnamed American billionaire. Alas, questions about the coin's provenance began to surface not long after the auction. As it turned out, the provenance had been entirely fake. The coin had been illegally dug up by looters in northern Greece circa 2010 and smuggled into the United States in 2014. From there, it was acquired by Roma Numismatics owner Richard Beale and brought to London. Beale sat on the coin for five years until he decided the time was ripe to sell it. As we all know, the wheels of justice move slowly. The coin was seized just six months ago, 
in February 2023 and returned to Greece a month later in March. Meanwhile, New York City's criminal court has charged Roma Numismatics owner Richard Beale with six crimes, including grand larceny in the first degree, criminal possession of stolen property in the first degree, and scheme to defraud in the first degree. We can only hope that for his sake, Richard Beale looks good in an orange jumpsuit. We expect that there will be no peacocks embroidered on this one. And there it is. Without proper provenance, a $4.2 million sale went into the toilet. Speaking of toilets, while the issue of provenance ordinarily applies to objects of intrinsic value, artistic value, and historical value, it also applies to a category of objects not yet discussed. That category is worthless crap, or relatively worthless crap, that is nevertheless considered of great value because of who it belonged to. For example, in 2012, an auction house in the United Kingdom offered up a pair of, quote, Elvis Presley's stained underwear, unquote, worn by the king during a concert in 1977. The auction catalog failed to describe the exact nature of the stains, though photographs of the undies left nothing to the imagination. I believe the colloquial term is skid marks. The underwear came with a reserve, or minimum bid, of 7,000 pounds, roughly $11,000. Stained underwear, worn during a concert in 1977. We, we ask the rhetorical question, could we place any monetary value on such an object if its provenance didn't trace to Elvis Presley? We think not. Thus, the power of provenance. And here we are then. The absurd prices collectors will pay for something that belonged to a famous and beloved person, no matter how mundane or even disgusting that object may be. And since Elvis Presley was among the most famous and beloved people born during the 20th century, the stuff he owned, provided its provenance is established through appropriate documentation, sells for crazy prices. Here, then, are just a few pieces of Elvis's stuff that have been sold to collectors, not including Elvis's jewelry, which is another category of stuff altogether, along with what I trust are the most recent prices. Elvis Presley's aforementioned 1956 Lincoln Continental Mark II price, $295,000. The king purchased the car in Miami on August 4, 1956, and it quickly became one of his favorite cars in his growing fleet. The 1956 Lincoln Continental Mark II was one of the last handmade automobiles in America, and only 3,012 were built between 1956 and 1957. The car was equipped with virtually every luxury car feature available at the time. Elvis's white Lincoln was sold at a charity auction in Guernsey, UK, to an anonymous buyer. Its present whereabouts are unknown. Elvis Presley's first recording price, $300,000. An acetate 78 RPM record featuring Elvis's first recording, a song called My Happiness, sold for $300,000 at an auction held at Graceland on January 8, 2015. The record was recorded by the 18-year-old Presley on July 18, 1953, at Sun Record Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. Mr. Presley, 
paid $4 to make the recording, which was intended as a gift for his mother, Gladys. The 10-inch disc was bought by the American musician, singer, songwriter, and music producer Jack White at an auction held at Graceland. White immediately digitally transferred the recording, had it remastered, and made it available on his record label, Third Man Records. A video was linked that documents the digital transfer of the disc. When on February 26, 2015, Jack White met with the music archivist Alan Stoker at the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee. Elvis Presley's private jet. Price? $600,000. The King owned three jets in his lifetime. Two of them are on display at the Graceland Museum. The third one, a 1962 Lockheed Jetstar JT-12-5, was purchased by Elvis on December 22, 1976, for $840,000. In 2008, it was sold in a cruise international auction to an anonymous buyer for $600,000. For our information, when the jet was auctioned off there in 2008, the engines were missing and the wings had been removed. So the winning bidder actually paid 600 k for a fuselage. <laughs> Perhaps the seller might have sweetened the deal by throwing in a pair of soiled underpants. There in 2008, the anonymous buyer certainly had money to burn because they simply left the jet where it had already been parked for 25 years, in the desert heat at Roswell International Air Center in New Mexico. And that's where it continued to sit, slowly disintegrating for another 15 years, until 2023. That's when it was auctioned off again, this time to a YouTuber named James Webb, who paid a comparatively modest 234000 for it. The auction took place on January 8th of this year, on what would have been Elvis's 88th birthday. The buyer, James or Jimmy Webb's entirely admirable and fascinating, I think, YouTube shtick, is to purchase derelict airplanes, refurbish them, and fly them. Unfortunately, as a flying machine, Elvis's jet turned out to be a lost cause, and only after he bought it did Webb discover that there was no way the jet would ever fly again. However, the great ones are undeterred by misfortune, and Jimmy Webb, as resilient as a tennis ball, decided to turn what was left of the jet into an RV. He told his YouTube fans, quote, What if we turned Elvis Presley's private jet into Elvis Presley's private RV, the king of the road? Here's my vision. It already has all the stuff on it, a diesel motor in the back, and it's got wheels and a generator we can use to power lights and air conditioning. How awesome is that? This is going to be fantastic. Unquote. Yeah, from your lips to God's ears, dude. Our request to Jimmy Webb, keep us in the loop. Another jumpsuit. Price, $1,012,500. This one, known as the Islet Jumpsuit and Gold Cape, was auctioned off by the entertainment memorabilia firm Krauss GWS Auctions, on September 4, 2021. Elvis wore the outfit during his famed performances at New York City's Madison Square Garden on June 9, 10, and 11, 1972. In 1972, Elvis Presley was still the king. In his review in the New York Times, Chris Chase wrote that every now and then, quote, a special champion comes along, 
a Joe Lewis, a Joe DiMaggio, someone in whose hands the way a thing is done becomes more important than the thing itself. When DiMaggio hit a baseball, his grace made the act look easy and inevitable. Friday night at Madison Square Garden, Elvis was like that. He stood there at the end, his arms stretched out, the great gold cloak giving him wings, a champion, the only one in his class." Unquote. Elvis gave four concerts over his three days at Madison Square Garden, and two of them were recorded, the concert held on the afternoon of June 10th and the one later that evening. The record featuring the evening concert, entitled Elvis as Recorded at Madison Square Garden, was released and in stores just eight days after the concert. The album, with Maestro Presley in his eyelet jumpsuit and cape emblazoned on the cover, sold big becoming a three times platinum album in the United States alone. Presley's outfit, like the peacock jumpsuit that initiated this post, was designed by Bill Ballou. Thanks to all the hubbub surrounding the Madison Square Garden concerts and the subsequent record albums, it became one of the most photographed and iconic costumes of Elvis's career. Would you like to see the jumpsuit in person? Good luck. The collector who bought the thing was, and remains, anonymous. Presley's 1942 Martin D-18 guitar, price $1,320,000. The current record holder for the most expensive piece of Elvis memorabilia that isn't a gold Rolex watch goes to Presley's 1942 Martin D-18 guitar, serial number 80221, which was auctioned for $1,320,000 by the rock and roll memorabilia site gottahaverockandroll.com on August 1st, 2020. In my humble opinion, the guitar was a steal at $1.32 million. Often referred to as Presley's Sun Sessions guitar, Elvis, who owned the thing between 1954 and 1956, began his career and made his first recordings for Sun Records with this guitar. Elvis decorated the guitar with little adhesive metal letters that spell out his name, though the S in Elvis is missing in action. Only E-L-V-I remain. According to the description of the guitar provided by the auctioneer, gotta have rock and roll .com, quote, the extensive wear visible on the guitar due to Elvis's hard strumming is testament to its considerable use by Elvis, unquote. Postscript, one last item. On the same Krauss GWS auction on September 4, 2021, that saw the sale of Elvis's eyelet jumpsuit and gold cape, a ball of Elvis Presley's hair sold for $115,120. Now, please, please, this wasn't just any hairball. According to Krauss GWS auctions, quote, this isn't a lock of hair that you typically find, but is a massive baseball-sized specimen which has not been offered for sale in nearly 20 years. This collection of hair was saved from haircuts given to Elvis Presley by his personal barber, Homer Gilliland, over the years and represents the largest and most well-documented collection of Elvis's hair in the world." Unquote. Well, talk about provenance. A $115,120 hairball. Damn, but that would display well with the underwear. To sample and download one or all 
of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.